Well, it's time to resume work on the pendant. The pieces have been cut out, the watercolor paper is prepared, and it's glued and dried. In the previous step, I had shown, showed you how to create what eventually will become the channel that you'll be able to thread your, your cord, your leather, your chain, whatever you're going to hang it from through. Looking at this, this is a completed piece, as you can see, hung on a leather cord with a handmade wire. I used a wire to make the, the clasp. And this is what I mean by the channel. The cord actually passes through the piece in a channel that I made while assembling it. The only difference between what I'm showing you here and what we have here is the channel here is invisible. Everything is flat. And this is quite a tedious task. Maybe I'll, I'll uh, do a demo of how to achieve this in another video. This is another way of doing it. Instead of having a flat surface, you have a slightly raised surface, so you actually see where the channel is. And I, I like that. I think it gives the back a nice look. Eventually, this will be covered with a decorative paper. And of course, the surface here is going to be covered with our watercolor paper. So, let's begin. What do we do with it now? We have this very rough looking thing. All the layers are nice and flat. Meaning, meaning they're glued together tightly and it's, it's hard. That's what I, I, meant, I meant before when I said thing, the glue is a structural component of the piece and actually contributes to its hardness. But what you have to do now is you, you have to sand it, you have to refine it. This is a roughly formed object and you just sand away and work it until it's a beautiful homogeneous looking mass of paper. You want to sand away the individual layers and roughness. Also in sanding you will be able to enhance the curved linear look of the piece. Now the only thing I want to point out, often I do this with a half round basted cut file. The flat side allows me to work on areas like this and the curved side allows me to get into the concave areas. When you're working with sandpaper, you can take your sandpaper and roll it on a pencil to give it a, a, a curve. And then you could use that to get into these concave areas. Now notice when I'm sanding, I avoid Often I'll avoid going back and forth like that because what that does, it creates a little burr in a lip. If we look at this, it would actually create a lip on this where in reality you want it nice and flat and, and smooth. You don't want a lip. You don't want to run your finger over there and feel it. Well, when you sand it, and I'm not going to do this on here, I don't want to damage this finished piece, but if you move your paper back and forth, the back motion will create that lip. So I always sand on a slight angle pretend this is a file of sandpaper. I sand on a slight angle into the piece and that gives me a nice clean edge. So this is what I mean. Of course in the initial rough stage I just might go back and forth like that but when I finish it off I definitely emphasize the forward, the forward stroke on an angle so I get a clean edge. And let me repeat, the channel was created by laying wax on the piece in the area that I want the cord to eventually go through and then I used a thinner paper and my Elmer's glue and I layered it on top of that wax and I, with my fingers, I worked into it so it's nice and flat.
I'll continue to do this until I'm thoroughly satisfied with the piece. I don't want to damage the surface of my watercolor paper by repeated handle in it in order to hold the piece during filing. The absolute last phase of building your piece is the gluing of the watercolor paper to the surface and the decorative paper to the back. And the wax. Wax will simply be melted out in our toaster oven. Don't rush this. Take your time. Work it. Finesse the edge. For areas where it's strongly concave or where you have a lot of excess paper to remove, I like to use a half round file. The curved side lets you get into sections like this. Remember, and remember what I said before when we were sandpapering it. Don't, especially with a file, don't go back and forth like that. Always push into the piece. And I'm, I'm in that concave area, so I'm, I'm using the round part of the file. I bought this file at Sears. It was relatively inexpensive, too. It was under $10. See? But it allows me to get a, a nice, sharp, clean edge. See, so even here, I have a discrepancy between the layers. So what I'll do is I'll actually sand into it so it becomes one flat surface and then when I cover it with an additional piece of watercolor paper the colored part you'll never see that see all these layers see if the camera could pick this up I don't want to see individual layers I want to sand it until the layers disappear and I have one smooth edge okay that area here definitely needs the file because the layers clearly are not flush with one another but like in a matter of seconds file will really dig into that and clean that up and I'm not only smoothing it out I'm looking at it I'm, I'm looking at the way the edge angles into the to the piece I'm refining the shape subtly adjusting the curves of the shape to create an elegant looking form. Notice how I switch back and forth. Finer sanding with the sandpaper, rougher sanding with the file. To complete our discussion of the basic form, the preliminary form, before the application of the watercolor paper that's been painted to create the final decorative piece. I've worked on it for quite a while. I've sanded the sides. I've used my half round file and sandpaper to clean it up and refine it and just make it look like a beautiful curved linear piece. In another video, I'll demonstrate the actual making of the channel. I would like to continue now with the development of this piece. The next step will be the application of the watercolor paper. Then we'll put the decorative back of paper on it. What I do at this stage is I explore the surface with these windows that result from cutting out the layers that make the piece. Now I look for areas that I find striking and it just there's unlimited possibilities. Really it's a matter of taste here. Anything can look good. Remarkable color patterns and, and shapes and textures that are suggested by the watercolor. Look at that. That's absolutely striking. Hmm. Then maybe I'll go with that one. Okay. Having found an area I like, the next step, make, make sure that you've lined it up properly with your piece. 
it'd be very upsetting to find a, a beautiful color area and then cut it out backwards so it doesn't fit. Well, what would you do? You'd make another piece and re reverse it, bend it the other way so it fits. Anyway, I'm going to retrace this one. This is going to be my surface layer. So I'm, I'm tracing it. Having traced that pencil outline around the area that I thought would really make for a nice piece of jewelry, I'm going to cut it out now. There we go. Cut out the piece. It's kind of wild and it's going to be the surface layer for my, my pendant. I'm going to glue that to that. At this point I got a piece of paper towel that I'll glue up my work on. I'm going to apply glue to the back of the cut out colorful section of watercolor paper and to the top of the piece that I've been filing and sanding and refining. The reason why I want to apply glue to this piece of paper that I just cut out is I actually want it to soften a bit. I want it to be a little wet and the glue will do that plus it'll give the extra adhesive um, quality but I want it to be softened a little bit this way it'll conform nicely to this shape that I have over here. So let's get to it. Chopsticks come in handy for holding down the parts of the pieces while you're gluing them up. It helps avoid the possibility of getting excessive amounts of glue on your hands. Like a little bit more glue there. As I said way back when we were creating the basic shape, is the glue becomes a structural element, so you want a certain amount of thickness. Of course, having that glued up nicely, I don't need quite as much on this because this, the glue, sort of primes it, gets it ready to be stuck to the other side. But more importantly, I want the moisture content of the glue to penetrate the paper and soften the paper a little bit. So I don't need quite as much. But I am making sure that surface is thoroughly coated. I don't want dry spots. These little things are annoying. Something else I like to just point out in terms of how I operate, I always have water available. So my paintbrush has been glued up. I just put it in the water. Otherwise in a half hour, that's a ruined brush. Now, I'll simply lift this beautiful little shape, put it on here. The challenge is, how do you press it down without making it a smeary mess? Well, that's where this comes in. I sandwich it with a piece of paper towel and I start to kind of just press into it, feel it, even feel where it is through the paper towel and for the next minute or so I I work it down onto the piece always being aware of where my edges are because I want it to, to line up nicely before too much time elapses 
Don't do this for five minutes because it's going to be glued in place. Do it for maybe 40 seconds. Then remove it from the towel. Be careful because you're going to have oozed out excess that you don't want to transfer to the nice piece. But the reason why I remove it is I want to see what is happening here. And I, I'll have to play with it a little bit more. Okay, a little risky doing it with without protecting it. So once again, I'm going to put it back. And you're going to have, you know, it's, it's going to be irregular. You're going to have to work it. Notice it's not covering that completely. That is not a problem. In finishing it up, I'll explain why it's not a problem. The problem right now, or the thing that you need to concern yourself with, is that you're getting absolute 100% contact. You don't want any areas of this to lift up. And I look at it from the back and the front. If it has to be slid over, I slide it over. I'm trying to do my best to have it cover that. base form that we created and the softness it's softening up more and more as I work it good good I'm just being careful not to transfer any glue to the surface haven't played around with it for a good three or four minutes now it's starting to grab onto the piece and conform to the shape. It's bending nicely. So what I'm going to do, I'm happy with where it is. I'll wrap it and take my chopstick and kind of burnish it with the chopstick. This is allowing me to press every, every part of it to the surface. So, how does it look? We're on our way with this. Absolutely. I'm just going to continue it's the little effort you make here doing what I'm doing that'll prevent it from developing separated areas and you don't want separated layers to occur because if you discover it after it's dry it's a difficult problem to, to fix and it takes away from the overall quality of your piece. And when you rub it like this, make sure it's, make sure it's sandwiched between a piece of paper towel. want to attack the edge a little bit more. So I could actually press it down and form it on the edge. But you see where I'm going? Okay. I'm going to take this and I'm going to let it dry for about a half hour. Then the final step will be to apply a little bit of decorative paper to the back of this. I don't want to leave it this white. This is ugly. I want to cover it. I want to make it beautiful. Remember that this channel has the wax embedded in it. That's going to be melted out eventually and allow us to slide through a cord. That's glued in place. It is dry. What I did is I put it in my toaster oven for about 20 minutes. Now I'm going to apply the decorative back paper. What, what I like to use for the back is this banana paper. It's absolutely beautiful. It's rich in texture. What I do is I just rough rough cut it. I press the piece up against the paper and I 
cut out approximately what I'm going to need. See, you don't have to be exact with this. It's also an extremely, it's, it's, a, it's actually a very tough paper, tough fibrous paper, but it's very thin. And it'll, it'll um, adhere nicely to the back. And then that's easily sanded off when it's dry. Apply glue like we've been doing. I'm painting it up with the glue. I'm being careful I don't get it on the face. And I actually don't need that much, darn it. I hate wasted material. But there's a risk having that much. So, to remove some of the excess glue. There's too much glue for the thinness of the paper I'm about to apply. It'll ooze all over the place. I don't need huge amounts. Okay, hopefully that's going to be okay. I'll take my, my banana paper now. I'll try to figure out which side is the most textured looking. And I'll lay it on the, the pendant. And what I like to do, I don't, I don't use my fingers. Again, I, I cover it with a piece of paper towel and I press it down. Well, well, here I could actually see on this side if, I, if I'm adequately overlapping everything so everything is evenly covered. And like we originally did, you hold it sandwiched between piece of paper towel and rub it in place making sure especially like in an area like that you want to you want to press it down you want 100% fusion to the pendant and you can feel it with your fingers Our nice refined piece is starting to look a little rough around the edges, but that's no big deal. We'll easily sand all this off. I want to make sure that we're looking good here. I don't want any bubbles that would ruin the piece. Okay, time to let it dry, and then we'll finish it up. The piece is nice and dry now, ready for sanding, the final sanding. I'm going to clean up all this roughness. This comes off real easy. Relatively fine, partially worn out piece of paper. It'll do the job. Notice I'm not going back and forth. Even if I choose to use a file, which I can, I'm not going to go back and forth. I'm just going to... In fact, that that works very effectively. Literally cutting the excess right off. Look at that. See how I switch from the flat side of the file to the curved side of the file as soon as I come to a concave area of the pendant? The final steps, it's sanded, it's resolved nicely. The wax is still in place. The wax has to be melted out eventually, but that's the very last thing after I varnish the surfaces. What I do now, I flow the watercolor on the edge, and a little bit of that, I dampen this, and a little of that works its way into this banana paper that's beautifully textured, and then I varnish the piece. The way I flow the watercolor is I first I dampen the edge. It's kind of like prime the surface because what's going to happen is there's going to be a tendency for the, the paint to actually not stick to the paper. And I, I dampen the back again too. And you'll understand why in a second. Okay.
being careful not to mess the surface. Having done that, now I'm going to take my watercolor and flow it into the into the edge. Now what I can do is just anything on the surface I can wipe off with my finger as long as I push it away from the piece. See? And I, I love what happens when you intermix colors. Let them naturally intermix on their own. And see how it's staining in the back? It's starting to seep in. That's the effect I want. Okay. I want to work it up to get rid of any white of the paper. And here, I got it on. Just quickly with my hand, wipe it off. Here, I'm going to... I'm going to work some of that red, the complementary red into there. Yeah. Okay, the piece is finished. Varnishing is all that remains to be done. And we'll do that in another video.